Please pray with me, guys. Father God, man, it is so good to lift up our voices to you this morning uh, in, in worship of you and, and uh, to show our love to you, God. It's because you loved us first that we can love you. And God, we just thank you for uh, your son. We thank you for the sacrifice that he made on the cross for us. And Lord, we just um, pray that your spirit would be here amongst us today as we uh, continue to dive into your word and study it. And Lord, I just pray that uh, your words would come out of uh Jeff's lips this morning, that um, everything that would fall out of his mouth would be exactly what you want to fall onto our ears today. And Lord, I just pray for um, open hearts uh, and, and just attentive minds today as, as we... Uh, just seek to gain a better understanding of you, God, and uh, your, your love for us and, and our walk with you. And God, I just pray for the rest of our day today and our fellowship after. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Man, I'm up again. I, I always want you to sing more. <laughs> I really, really enjoy the singing and the music that you guys do. I love hearing everyone singing and rejoicing in the Lord. And so thank you all for your great leadership this morning. Would you turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, we're going to read verses 1 through 17. And even before you ask, there is a good purpose for this. In the weeks that I'm out here, I'm going to be preaching some select messages from the book of Matthew. The last time, two weeks ago, we were in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, where we had seen that Jesus is the rightful king. And now we're going to come back and we're going to be able to see some of the heritage that establishes him as the king and the things that we can learn from it. So would you please stand with reverence for the Lord and His Holy Word. I'll read aloud as you follow along in your own Bibles. This is not a passage of Scripture that you've probably heard read publicly very often, but as we're going to see, it's very, very important. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Aram. Aram begot Amminadab, Amminadab begot Nashon, Nashon begot Solomon. Solomon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon begot Rehoboam, Rehoboam begot Abijah, Abijah begot Asa, Asa begot Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat begot Joram, and Joram begot Uzziah. Uzziah begot Jotham, Jotham begot Ahaz, and Ahaz begot Hezekiah. Hezekiah begot Manasseh, Manasseh begot Ammon, Ammon begot Josiah, Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time that they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Shealtiel, Shealtiel begot Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel begot Abiad, Abiad begot Eliakim, Eliakim begot Azor, Azor begot Zadok, Zadok begot Achim, and Achim begot Eliad, Eliad begot Eliezer, Eliezer begot Mathan, Mathan begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, from David until the captivity in Babylon, 14 generations, and from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. And my friends, this is the word of the Lord. Would you please be seated? As I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago, this book, Matthew, is presenting the rightful claim of Jesus as being not only the king of the Jews, but being the king of the universe. By the end of this book, we're going to hear that all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. So Jesus has the authority, the power. He has the rightful claim as the king. I had used an analogy before. I talked about King Arthur of Camelot and told you how that I loved some of the, the legends of King Arthur. And I loved the legend of how he was seen to be the rightful king. You remember that there had been a sword that had been placed into a stone. And the legend was that whoever could withdraw that sword from the stone would be the rightful king. And so there were big, strong, powerful guys who tried to use their might and force and power and just bulldoze that thing and make the, but they could never budge the sword. There were smart people, the nerds, the high tech ones. They were the ones who engineered it and they thought if we just use a lever or if we just use some sort of pulley, we'll be able to budge the sword, but they could never move it out of the stone. And then there are even people who are using black magic. They are trying to use sorcery. So people like Mer Merlin and some of the other magicians where they were trying to somehow move the sword, but they couldn't. No one was able to budge it until a young orphan boy named Arthur came and grabbed hold of the handle, 
pulled, and when he pulled, it just pulled right out, smooth as butter. And it was now established that this was more than just a little orphan boy. This was a rightful heir to the throne. Well, that is the stuff of legend. But the book of Matthew is not about a legend. The book of Matthew is establishing the right or the authority of Jesus Christ as the king of the Jews. That's why this book begins, that Jesus is the son of David and the son of Abraham, and as such, is telling us that he is the rightful heir to the throne. But then beyond that, he's going to come to a conclusion by the end of this book that Jesus is not just the king of the Jews, he's the king of the universe, because he has all authority in heaven and on earth, that he's the one who has the rightful claim to the throne, not just the throne of David or the throne of the Jews, but he is the rightful heir to the throne of the universe. King of kings, Lord of lords. Today, we're going back to the very beginning of Matthew, these first 17 verses, not only to find the heritage, the lineage, uh, the birthright of Jesus, but this is telling us something far more. It's giving us some more important details about who Jesus is, and it tells us something about God. And I want us to all be able to recognize that even through a listing of names, like what we've read this morning, there are some important truths to know about God. And here's the first one. Are you ready? First truth you need to know about God is God is faithful to His promise. You see, this lineage and all these different names that are listed here, you may recognize some, there will be others, you have no idea what they are. They are intended to be listed for us in the beginning of this book of Matthew to remind us that God keeps His promises. To say that God keeps His promises means that Matthew 1 is beginning the New Testament. It's the very first words of all of the gospel that are going to be presented to us, and it's going to remind us that Jesus is the son of David and the son of Abraham. Let me remind you that God kept His promises to Abraham. I'm going to start with that one first. We call that the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant was a promise that God had established with Abraham by which he appeared to him when he was 75 years old. Everyone hear these details. He was 75 years old when God first appeared to him and said, Abraham, I want you to get up out of your kindred from your father's house, go to a land that I will show you. In other words, I want you to become an immigrant. I want you to go away from where your home is, away from your familiar family. You're going to go to a new place. That new place is going to eventually become the promised land, the land of Canaan. And he's going to receive that as a gift from God. But God didn't just say, I'm going to give you a land. He also said, I am going to make of you a great nation. When he talks about making of him a great nation, it means that he's going to have children, eventually would describe this, as, as being more numerous than all of the stars of the heaven. He would have heritage. He'd have children that would be more numerous than the grains of sand that are on the beach. You're not going to be able to number the number of children that come from you because I'm going to make of you, Abraham, a great nation. And out of that great nation, he said, I'm going to bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Just as a side point, I, I believe that that Abrahamic prom promise or that principle there of blessing those who bless you and cursing those who curse you, I think that that's still remaining intact to some extent today. Uh, I know that all of the nation of Israel as we know it today are not all of God's people, Israel, from the standpoint that they are not all believers in Jehovah. I understand that there's some debate or argument about this, but I still think that when we bless those people, the children of Abraham, the Jewish nation, when we bless them, there is a blessing. As an example, I would point to you, Congressman Doug Lamborn, the boss that I work for, very few people know that Congressman Doug Lamborn from right here in Colorado is the best friend for Israel in the entire House of Representatives. A few years ago, Congressman Lamborn was the one who secured a doubling of the funding that was necessary to get something that they call Iron Dome up to speed. Iron Dome is what we saw just a couple years ago when there are some Palestinians and Syrians and other people who were enemies of Israel. They're trying to send in rockets and mortars and trying to destroy the city of Jerusalem. And the Iron Dome went into effect. That Iron Dome was being able to shoot down all those missiles with other missiles. So they'd be able to have other projectiles that would see a rocket coming in and be able to shoot it. Some of you may have even seen some of the pictures on the internet where you had just these streaming rockets all the way across the skies and one stream after another and they're all getting shot down by the different rockets that were there. Some of that was the vision of President Ronald Reagan many years ago in the 1980s. 
He said, we're going to develop, they called it Star Wars at that time. They make fun of it because they say, with all those missiles that were there, rather than have mutual assured destruction of just us having bigger missiles than the other people and now destroying each other, he said, no, we need to have a missile defense system. Well, that missile defense system, all of these years later, works. And the Iron Dome that has protected Jerusalem was something that had been funded and championed by my boss, Congressman Doug Lamborn. And as a result of his commitment, I believe that his commitment to Israel is something that is really ensuring him to continue continued success in his political career. Because when God says, I'm going to bless those who bless you, I do believe that God continues to fulfill that Abrahamic covenant. But beyond the Abrahamic covenant of blessing, he also says, he says, through you, all nations of the earth will be blessed. Well, how is it that all nations of the earth will be blessed through Abraham and through his seed? Well, that is an introduction to Jesus Christ, the Messiah. When Matthew 1 tells us that Jesus came as the son of Abraham, that means that God has fulfilled his promise to Abraham by sending us one of his seed who is going to become a savior for the world. You see, Jesus is not just a savior who's come to save his own people from their sin. He doesn't just save Jews. He doesn't just save a few elect people or an ethnicity. No, through him... All nations of the earth are blessed because Jesus is a Savior for all mankind. That's why he can give this invitation. Come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. He's a Savior, not just for a few select elite. He is a Savior for all from every nation who would come to him by in saving faith. So God keeps his promise. I want you to hear this because not only did God keep his promise to Abraham that he formed when he was 75, but a few years later, Abraham was about 90 years old and he was becoming discouraged. He thought, man, you know, it's been 15 years. I did leave my family. I did leave my land. I, I, I came to a foreign place, but I still don't have a child. And if I don't even have one child, who's going to be heir to my throne? And he had met with God. And he said, God, how about if you just take Eliezer, my servant, and make him the heir? And God appeared to him and he said, no, no, I am Almighty God. I'm El Shaddai. Nothing is difficult for me. And you just need to believe and trust that I am going to give you a child and you will bear so he gave that promise a second time. Nine years later, Abraham was 99 years old. When Abraham was 99 years old, he was believing in God. And by the way, Abraham had tried, Abraham and Sarah, his wife, had tried to fulfill God's promise on their own strength. Remember, Sarah came and she said, Oh, Abraham, since you're not having a child by me, maybe what we need to do is have you take my, my handmaiden, Hagar, and through her, we're going to have a child. And Ishmael, you may remember, was born out of their flesh or out of their act of, uh, of disobedience or really out of an act of a, a lack of faith because they were trying to fulfill what God had promised. God comes back and said, no, no, you don't need to somehow fulfill my promises for me. Abraham, by the time he was 99 years old, he looked at his wife, Sarah, who was 90 years old. He knew that she was past age, um, the age of bearing children. He, he knew that there, this is going to be impossible. With men, it's impossible that we never have, even have a child. But God came and says, no, no, I am almighty God. Nothing is difficult for me. I am going to fulfill my promise. And it's not going to be by your power of your flesh. It's not going to be by your coercion. You believe me and I will fulfill it. And sure enough, God did cause Sarah to have a child, even in her old age. And Abraham, the Bible says, believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. I'm trying to tell you a story. It reminds us from the lineage of Jesus that God keeps his promises. And when God keeps his promises, you don't have to manipulate them. You don't have to control them. All you have to do is believe them. So let me ask you a couple of promises that God may have made toward you. Do you really believe that when God says all things work together for good to those who love him and are called according to, your, to his purpose, do you really believe that God keeps his promise? Do you really believe that when God says, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age, you believe that God keeps his promise? Do you really believe the promise when God comes and says, I will never leave you nor forsake you? Maybe someone here today needs to be reminded that God keeps his promises. And if God keeps his promises to Abraham, then you can count on this reality. God will keep his promise to you. You can trust him. God is faithful to his promise. It's not only the promise to Abraham, it's also the promise to David. He said, this is the son of David and the son of Abraham. The promise to David is that, David, I am going to give you a child, I'm going to give you a son, who will sit upon your throne forever. This wasn't just going to be fulfilled by a few obedient people who would continue sitting upon the David Davidic dynasty. 
He was referring primarily to one future Messiah. He describes that Messiah in Isaiah 9, 6, when he says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And listen, of the increase of his government, there will be no end. That means it's going to be a growing kingdom that continues to reach further and further. And he says, and he will sit upon the throne of his father David forever and ever. You see, God had promised that one of his children, David's children, one of those sons of David will become a Messiah who would sit upon the throne forever. Jeremiah 23, verse 5, tells us that there would be a branch from David and that he would rule in righteousness and justice and that he would bring peace upon the earth. And that was going to need to be fulfilled. Even in the days that Jesus came to be born, the Jewish people were looking for that Messiah, the son of David, who would sit upon that throne. But what we come to find out is that that throne is not just going to be an earthly throne, like a Roman Empire or like an Israeli Empire. No, there's going to be a, a farther, broader expression of that. He will establish a spiritual kingdom that would also eventually lead to that peace and justice and righteousness. Here's what I want you to know. God keeps His promise. When God keeps His promise to David, He sends a son of David who would sit upon His throne. And what we know about Jesus is that Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham and His promise to David. Can anyone agree with me? God keeps His promises. Would anyone say amen to this? So these list of names are telling us one important truth. First important truth is telling us that God is faithful to His promise. But then that list of names gives us a second very important truth. Are you ready for it? Not only is God faithful to His promise, but God forgives His people. Oh, you guys, this list of all the people that we read through. Some of you are sitting there saying, Jeff, how in the world are you going to try to preach a message out of all this lineage or all these names that are here, this heritage? That... Wait, you go through all those names, and ultimately, if you know anything about any of their history you're going to discover that none of them are worthy people. All of them have messed up stories. When, one day, my daughter, Alyssa, came to me. She had known that I'd been making a practice to read through my Bible numerous times every year. I'd gone to Africa and found out the tremendous love for the Bible that they have for, for over there. And I started thinking, man, here are people who are willing to give the shirt off their back, literally, to give a shirt off their back to have a Bible. I need to start cher cherishing and treasuring the Bible. So I came back and I started reading, trying to read through the Bible at least five times a year. I mean, that's a lot. But I tried to read through the Bible five times a year for the next five years. And so my, my daughter, Alyssa, knew that I was obsessed with reading the Bible. I wasn't reading the newspaper or Sports Illustrated. I wasn't getting distracted by hunting and magazines or anything else. I was like, man, if I have a spare moment, I'm going to just be pouring myself into the Bible. Well, Alyssa decided that she was going to start reading the Bible. And that's when she came, to, she came to me one day and she said, Dad, I've been reading this portion in uh, the book of Judges. And man, there's a lot of really, really bad things that are happening in this book. I mean, this is just, there's a lot of awful stories that are here. And I had to pull her aside and say, you know something? This is proof that this book is true. Because if it was just a legend, you would get rid of all the bad news and you would tell only the good side of the story. But God wants us to know that these are real people with real problems and they need a real Savior, the Lord Jesus. Well, what I want you to know is that this lineage of Jesus is going to uncover some of the most messed up stories in all of the Old Testament. And yet, here's what's amazing. Some of those messed up stories find themselves even into the heritage or lineage of Jesus. So, for instance, you go through all these lists of names and you would find only four females that are being referred to. And the four females that are being referred to, it wasn't common that the ladies would be mentioned anyway. And usually if you did mention the, the ladies in a heritage or in a lineage, it would be because they were notably or exceptionally good. But in this passage, you have four stories from females. Let me rehearse them for you because these ladies are reminding us that God forgives His people. For instance, He says that there's a lady named Tamar. So Judah, the son of, uh, of Isaac, the son of Jacob, uh, one of the twelve tribes of Israel, Judah, it says, begat Perez and Zamar by Tamar. Let me tell you this story. Be ready, because it's a little bit messed up. But when you hear this messed up story, it's going to remind us that God forgives people to the point where He, he even includes messed up stories in this lineage. 
Judah had been one of the 12 sons of Jacob. So he's one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, pretty well known. But Judah had married a Canaanite woman, something that he'd been commanded not to do, but he's walking in disobedience by marrying a woman who's from Canaan. They have three sons. The name of the first son is Ur. Now, the E-R there, I don't think, is, is confessing that, oh, I made a big mistake. I mean, having the name E-R, Er, kind of like error, it almost sounds like you name your child, oops, you know, oops, I made a big mistake. Maybe I shouldn't marry this woman. Maybe I shouldn't have this child. All right, all of that is just a joke. I'm not talking about any kind of Hebrew origin of the name Er. But the name Ur is referring to his first son. And then he had a second son, and then he had a son, I think the, the third son is Selah. I can't remember his name. Anyway, so you have three sons. As you can understand, I can only remember the name of the first son because he was the mistake, all right? So there was Ur, and then there was another, and there was another. All right, so Ur ends up growing up and having, um, having a wife. He married a woman, and it says that God knew that Ur was a wicked man, so God killed him. So he is dead without having a child. According to their tradition, the second born would then marry the widow and bear a child who would carry on the family name. But this guy was so wicked that he didn't want to bless his brother or his family, and so he was selfish, and as a result of his disobedience and his disobedience in refusing to raise up a child that would be part of the family line, that he too was killed. Now, you're, you have Judah who's looking at it and saying, I've got three sons. Two of them have already died as a result of this lady. She's like the black widow. I don't want my third son marrying her. And so he says, wait until my son grows up. But when he becomes an adult, then I will give him to you and we'll continue the family line. Well, when the child had grown up, Tamar figured out that she was not going to receive that man as a husband. And now she's being treated as some sort of black widow or she was excluded. And so she decided to take matters into her own hand. What she did is she knew that Judah was going to go off on a journey. And so she dressed as a harlot. She went out to the place where he was and he hired her for, for sex. He hired her like a prostitute. And when he hired her, he gave her some, some symbols of the money that he would give because he didn't have the cash on hand, and so he left some signs. And then she, through that incestuous immorality, bears a child. A couple months later, they find out that she's pregnant, and Judah's ready to kill his daughter-in-law because she, he thinks that she's just gone off and lived the wild life and gotten pregnant. And now she comes out, she says, all right, here's the father of my, of my child, and she brings out those signet, the, the, the staff and the things that represent that, that Judah realized, oh my goodness, I'm the one who had gone into that lady. And now this child that she's going to have is going to be my child. And now what I'm telling you is that our God is a God of mercy and grace and forgiveness. And he's the one who brings beauty for ashes. He's the one who brings redemption out of awful stories. And so some of you are like plugging the ears of your children saying, Jeff, I can't believe that you're telling me such an awful story. Wait a second. I'm not the one who's telling you this awful story. In Genesis chapter 38, it talks about how that Tamar not only bears these children, but you guys, Tamar finds her name in the lineage of Jesus. How could it be possible that God is able to take this person out of this awful circumstance and somehow bring good out of it? Let me tell you why. Because in Matthew 1, verse 21, a little bit later down from where we've been reading, it tells us this. You will call his name Jesus, for he saves his people from their sins. Listen, this is not a genealogy that's going to be listed with a bunch of good, religious, upright, moral, righteous people. As a matter of fact, he couldn't list any of them. Are you ready? Because there's none righteous, not even one. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks after God. All have sinned and far short of the glory of God. You can look at me in my eyes right now. Everyone look at me in my eyes for a second. Let me tell you something. That if God is able to somehow include Tamar and her awful story through the redemption of the Lord Jesus, if God is able to emphasize to us that God came to not only keep His promises, but God came to forgive His people, then would you look at me in my eyes and would you hear this? God is able to forgive you. There's not anyone here that is living a life by which you are worthy to be in the king's lineage simply because of your good works or your religious attitude. No, the truth is God came to save people like Tamar. Tamar is not the only one that's mentioned, though. It also mentions a lady named Rahab. Does anyone know a little bit about the history of Rahab? As a matter of fact, you might even know her nickname, Rahab the Rahab the harlot. 
She got two strikes against her. Number one, she is a um, she's a Gentile. She's not even of Jewish heritage or Jewish lineage. She's a Gentile. Because God is emphasizing through this woman that God is able to not only save Gentiles and forgive Gentiles, but God is willing to even include Gentiles in the lineage of the Messiah. Are you kidding me? He doesn't only use Gentiles. A woman, um, Rahab, who had been part of Jericho. Remember the story of how the Jericho was that first wall that they were going to, or the first city that they'd come to when they're invading the Promised Land. And when Joshua and his men come in, they come to Jericho, they march around in all those days, and eventually the city comes, the walls of the city come crashing down. The only walls that remain were the walls that were there of Rahab, because Rahab, even though she'd been a harlot, she had believed that God was indeed working through these children of promise. She had saved some of the spies that had come into the land and preserved and kept them. And so God preserved Rahab and her family. And the reason that he saved and preserved Rahab and her family is because our God forgives people from their sins. It's not only Tamar who's found in this lineage, not only Rahab is finished, but then there's another one named Ruth. Does anyone, is anyone able to fulfill the name Ruth the, what? Ruth the Moabite. So Ruth the Moabite is going back into the heritage by which the Moabites were, again, enemies of the Jewish people. She didn't come from the right tribe, the right name, the right group. She didn't even come from the right nation. She was a Moabite, and yet as a Moabite, she is included in the lineage of Jesus. And it's included to remind us something. God does forgive His people. And God does. God does. He is faithful to His promise. The last person, the last female that's mentioned in this heritage or this lineage, it doesn't even mention her name. It says... That, she, that this one had been born through her who had been the wife of David. Or she, she who had been the wife of Uriah, I believe is the way that it's described there. Does anyone care to guess who we're talking about? David was born through, no, no, not David, Solomon. Solomon the son was born through the son of David through her who had been the wife of Uriah. It's a lady called Bathsheba. Someone already called the name out. You know about Bathsheba? I'm going to talk about a little bit of a dirty story. I'm going to talk about a soap opera of the Old Testament. He even mentions Uriah by name because I think it's important for us to remember that Bathsheba had been a woman that David was attracted to and drawn to. The Bible tells us that David the king had been up on his rooftop in a time when everyone else was out to war. So Uriah was one of his soldiers, one of his warriors, had been out to war, conquering lands on behalf of David. David should have been out there with his men, but he's sitting up on a rooftop in the cool of the day, and he looks down and he sees a woman who's bathing. When he sees the woman who's bathing, he becomes attracted to her and calls for the woman, and sure enough, he commits adultery. And in committing adultery, he brings her up, takes someone else's wife, and even though David is a man after God's own heart, he commits sin. His first sin was the lust, his second sin was the adultery, and then he found out that she was with his child. So now she's pregnant. And now he has to figure out, how am I going to deal with this? David chooses to try to cover his sin. Is everyone ready for this? The book of Proverbs tells us that whoever covers his sin will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. So now you come to your life and you realize, huh, all of us are filled with sin. The only question is, how do we deal with our sin? If you try to cover your sin, well, you can try, try going the route of David. David decided that he was going to try to hide his adultery, hide his sin, by asking Uriah to come back from the front lines. So he sends a message, has Uriah come back from the war, comes back from the front lines, and he says, all right, hopefully Uriah will go in to his wife, and, they'll think, and then he'll think that that's is his child. People, that's deception. It's an awful plan. Uriah wouldn't go to his wife because he sat outside the king's palace and he said, while well, all of my men are out there at war, I'm not going to go and enjoy uh, the relationship with my wife. So David, take the next step. Next night, he decides, okay, well, I'm going to get him drunk. If I get him drunk out of his mind, then maybe he'll go and be with his wife that night. Uriah still, even though he had gotten him drunk that night, Uriah wouldn't go and be with his wife. And as a result, David sends Uriah back to the front line carrying this message. When you go up to the battle, go close to the wall, and when you get close enough to the wall, I want everyone to pull back away from Uriah so that Uriah will be killed by the men that are there and attacking the wall. You know what that's called? 
That's called murder, people. It's called murder. David was willing to go to the point of murder to hide the sin that he had already committed with Bathsheba. And sure enough, Uriah was killed as a result of David's plotting and scheming and his murder. Eventually, as you all know, David came to be confronted by his sin. There's a prophet called Nathan who had come to David and confronted him about the awful sin that he had produced. And that's why David, even though he is a man after God's own heart, by the way, please, would everyone look up at my eyes and see this again? David is a man after God's own heart. Not because he was perfect, not because he was even moral, not because he had never committed a sin. I mean, people, he's an adulterer, he's a murderer. But when David was confronted with his sin, listen to what he said. He came to a point of confession where he said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. You see, being a person after God's own heart is not being someone who is super religious and never misses a week of church or Sunday school. That's not how to be a man after God's own heart. Being a man after God's own heart is not a matter of keeping all the rules and somehow keeping yourself moral. And now you feel yourself morally superior to everyone else. Therefore, you are a man after God's own heart. Stop it. God resists the proud. He resists the proud, even the morally proud or the religiously proud. You don't, you don't come to God's heart by being so arrogant and proud and of your own self-righteousness, your judgmental attitude. God takes even an immoral man like David, a murderer like David, and He takes someone who's of humility and brokenness, who can now with humility say, God, have mercy upon me. It's not because I deserve it, not because of the great prayers I pray, not because of the tears that I shed, but I'm asking, Lord, for your mercies, for your loving kindness. I'm asking you to blot out my transgressions and wash me from my sin. And listen to me, if God can forgive David, and beyond David, if God can forgive Bathsheba. By the way, could I now talk to you plainly and tell you that even though God forgives, that that doesn't eliminate sometimes the consequences of our sin? Sometimes because of the consequences of our sin, David's first child with Uriah, or with, I'm sorry, with Bathsheba, that first child lost its life. And David had been praying and crying out, Lord, please keep this child safe and preserve it. But no, there were consequences. And as a result, he and his wife grieved at the loss of that little child. But God gave them a second child. And when God gave them that second child, it would become Solomon the king, who would not only be the king after David, but he would be in the line of the Messiah. Is everyone tracking with me? The lineage of Messiah is filled with the messy stories, messy stories that remind us that not only does God keep His promise, but God forgives His people. There's not anyone in this room today who can somehow think that you are worthy. There's no one in this room that can somehow thank God that you are worthy. That you are a gift to God. Man, what would He do if it weren't for me being here in this church and helping guide them? What would I do? If, what would God do if He didn't have me and my talents coming and serve the church? No, there's nobody who can come with that attitude. If you read the lineage of Jesus, you have to come to the conclusion that the Almighty King, the one who has, the one who has authority in heaven and on earth, is not only a king who keeps his promise, because God is faithful to his promise, but he's also a God who forgives his people. And if he forgives his people, then my friends, every single one of us comes with a humble, contrite heart that says, thank you, Lord, for your mercies that are new every morning. Thank you for your faithfulness. You know what I've just done? I tried to set the table, Tanner, for communion. Because when we come to a communion table, no one's coming to a communion table thinking that they are somehow worthy, more worthy than one person or another. We come like Tamar, and like Rahab, like Ruth, and like she who had been the wife of Uriah. We come and we eat a piece of bread that reminds us of the body of Jesus that said He was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. The way Jesus saves people from their sin is He takes our guilt and our sin and our punishment. All the punishment we deserve is poured out upon Jesus as a substitute. I'm not telling you that God forgives people because He just winks at it or casts a blind eye. He's not somehow some sort of super soft grandfather type of God who just says, oh, Tamar, it's okay. No problem. Just live how you want. No, no. He takes all of Tamar's sin and guilt. He takes all of Judah's awful hypocrisy and immorality and sin. He takes all of David's error. He takes all of the sin of all of our people and he places upon a Messiah, a substitute, 
who dies for our sins. That means that He bears our sin, our guilt, our punishment. He takes what we deserve. That is the body that we're remembering, a body that was broken for us. And in a moment, we're going to drink a cup, a cup that reminds us of the blood of Jesus, a blood that cleanses us from all sin, a Savior who is able to save to the utmost anyone who will come to Him in faith. And friends, please, look at me and listen. You don't find forgiveness by coming to a sacrament of communion. You find forgiveness by coming to what this sacrament, what this is pointing to. It's pointing us to a Savior who saves His people from their sin, Jesus. And if you believe in Him and receive the, the wounds that were poured out upon His body, then you can have forgiveness. If you receive His blood, it will wash us as clean as we could ever be. You see, we're not coming for a, a sacrament. We're coming to something that this is pointing to. This is pointing us to this reality. A God who forgives His people and a God who keeps His promises. Goodness. That heritage of the King becomes pretty meaningful to us, doesn't it? Thank God for this kind of King. Not only the rightful King, but a merciful King, a gracious King, a Savior King. Let's bow together, please, and let's pray. Lord, today we thank You for the Lord Jesus that is demonstrated to be the rightful king through the heritage, through that lineage that he was born of. We know that he became a child of David, fulfilled the Davidic covenant, he became the child of Abraham, fulfilled that Abrahamic covenant. But even more than that, Lord, we thank you that he became a savior that was born out of a sinful generation. Lots and lots of sinful people that are listed in this passage. But it reminds us, Lord, that you came to seek and to save that which is lost. And Lord, we come to you today, not with any kind of religious claim, not with any kind of moral claim, not with any kind of theological claim. No, no, we come humbly and acknowledging that we need a Savior who saves people from sin. Lord, come into my life with all the mistakes that I've made, with all the errors that I continue to, and instead of covering my sin and blaming on someone else or trying to trying to cover it with one lie or another lie. Instead of covering our sin today, we're going to come and confess. Lord, we need you. We acknowledge you. We need you. Would you please show your mercies? Would you restore us? Would you make, would you make beautiful things out of the life that we had brought into ashes? With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, would you take just a few minutes of examining your own heart, coming to a place of humility and confession? Maybe even just weighing some of those things out and saying, man, you know what, it's true. Even in my own life, this week, I've had thoughts that were not worthy. I've said words that were not worthy. I've lived a life that wasn't worthy. I'm coming back and I'm ask, asking, Lord, not only would you forgive me and cleanse me, but Lord, would you, would you bring newness of life? Would you bring transformation? Would you bring change? Lord, we come with a humility that acknowledges that you have been so good and so gracious to us. For some of my friends that are here today, remind them, Lord, that you keep your promises. Let them find great hope. Let them find faith, even in the midst of some of their disappointments or some of their uncertainties, knowing that if God kept his promise to Abraham and kept his promise to David, he'll certainly keep his promise to me. Lord, help us to, to just respond to who you are as you made yourself known through this passage. In Jesus' name. Tanner, come on up. We're going to turn it to you and let you lead us, please, to the Lord's table. chapter 11 verse 23 through 26 it says for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That bread, we chew it up and it is a sustenance to us. Jesus, that bread represents the Lord's body. The Lord's body was chewed up 
pretty bad, but that is what sustains us, is his gift to us. The cup represents his blood, which was poured out for us. When you bleed an animal, that's its life running out on the ground. And this is the life of Christ that he gives freely to all of us. And we need to recognize that. I've asked a few fellers if they would come and help me pass out the bread and the juice. So if they come on up. Let's go ahead and pray real quick. Dear Lord, we thank you for what you do for us. Thank you for the way you have given your life for us that we can ask of you and you will give freely to us this life. Help us to remember you when we do this. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us and give to us. Thank you for this representation of your body and your blood. Help us to drink it, remembering you. Thank you for your kindness to us and for your gift to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before they sing this song, I think it's amazing. They're going to sing a song about how he knows my name. They had no idea. They were going to go through all those names in Matthew chapter 1. But they chose that song, and that reminds us, man, not only are all, all those names part of the lineage, but he knows us by name. He knows everything about us. What a, what a great God, how he forgives us, how, he, how, he, uh, how he's faithful to his promise. Should we stand? Should we sing? Let's sing. Let's sing. Yeah.
your word today. Thank you that, that you forgive us, that you welcome us, even, even through our mistakes, and that you made a way that we can be forgiven. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for loving us so much. Lord, help us to help us to understand that. Help us to know and understand what you've done and who we are in you. Thank you for that, Lord. And thank you for your love. Help us to go out this week and, and uh, be a blessing to others and share the good news. Lord, I just ask um, a blessing on the meal today. And Lord, I just thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to share with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.